How did David Foster Wallace feel about political correctness in language? Because in 2024, as writers and as citizens, we are put in a dialectic where we either have to comply with political correctness or rebel against it. And it puts us in these weird polarization patterns where we have to exist in endless loops of us versus them mentalities. And Wallace is going to speak on political correctness at length today, and he has a much more nuanced view because he identifies the bizarre reality of political correctness in the language wars. And in these wars, to generalize, there are two different camps. There are the prescriptivists who believe, we could call them the grammar Nazis, they believe that there are certain rules of language and that standard written English should not should be changed very slowly and that it's very important to learn standard written English. And then you have the descriptivists who believe that language is just what's being said, that language is always evolving and how people are using language is what the language is and that these prescriptivists with their outdated grammar rules and all this other stuff are silly. And in general, conservatives more fall into the prescriptivist camp and liberals fall into the, de the descriptivist camp. Even though that 99% of people and voters out there have no, not a care in the world about language or grammar or the language wars. But the interesting flip over the past 20 or 30 years with political correctness is that the grammar Nazis, the tyrants in language have become the woke, the people on the left who have now entered the prescriptivist camp. They are now saying that language is supposed to be a certain way, that you have to use it in a dogmatic way. You're, it's not brung, it's brought. It's not hung, it's hanged. It's not idiot, it's retard. Oh wait, that was the first change. Oh wait, it's not retard, it's mentally handicapped. Oh wait, it's not that, it's mentally disabled. Oh wait, it's not that, it's we're all the same and everyone's equal. Oh my God, it's not that, it's we're not equal so we all need to be equitable. Oh wait, it's not that, it's I'm done being equitable because why were you ahead of me in the first place so now you need to go lower than me so that we can make up for earlier inequality. So if you guys don't know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace here on YouTube. If you look at the playlist down below, I already have 60 videos on Wallace and I'm posting new videos daily. So let us now hear from Wallace. And we are starting at the top of the screen right here where my mouse is. This reviewer's own opinion is that prescriptive, politically correct English, that's PCE, is not just silly, but ideologically confused and harmful to its own cause. Here is my argument for that opinion. Usage is always political, but it's complexly political. With respect, for instance, to political change, usage conventions can function in two ways. On the one hand, they can be a reflection of political change, and on the other, they can be an instrument of political change. What's important is that these two functions are different and have to be kept straight. Confusing them in particular, mistaking for political efficacy what is really just a language, language's political symbolism, enables this bizarre conviction that America ceases to be elitist or unfair simply because Americans stop using certain vocabulary that is historically associated with elitism and unfairness. This is politically correct English's core fallacy, that a society's mode of expression is productive of its attitudes rather than a product of those attitudes. We're back up here at the top, and of course, it's nothing but the obverse of the politically conservative snoots delusion that social change can be retarded by restricting change in standard usage. Forget Stalinization or Logic 101, Level equivocations, though. There's a grosser irony about politically correct English. This is that politically correct English purports to be the dialect of progressive reform, but is in fact in its Orwellian, Orwellian substitution of the euphemisms of social equality for social, social, social equality itself, a vastly more help to conservatives and U.S. status quo than traditional snoot prescriptions ever were. Were I, for instance, a political conservative who opposed using taxation as a means of re redistributing national wealth, I would be delighted to watch politically correct progressives spend their time and energy arguing over whether a poor person should be described as low income or economically disadvantaged or pre-prosperous, rather than constructing effective public arguments for redistributing, excuse, excuse me, uh, redistributive legislation or higher marginal tax rates. And so most of the time when people are using this politically correct language, they're not homeless, they are unhoused. What they are doing is virtue signaling. And these people don't care about the unhoused or the pre-prosperous. Because if they did, as I'm gonna talk about in a couple minutes, they would have a totally different attitude in their approach to these problems. And politically correct language has a connection to vogue words. And if you don't know what vogue words are, 
it's when people like I, you guys have met people like this. Maybe you're one of these people. You're at a restaurant and like this has such an artesian feel. It's like in this iconic part of the city. And it's so awesome to be here with you in this timeless place. You know, the other place we were at earlier it felt kind of culty and damp. But the synergy in this place really feels like I'm escaping the matrix. And later on in the conversation, you know, the bottom line is that we have to create a new framework for constructive criticism. You know, people that talk like this. And don't worry, I do this stuff all the time. I love that word synergy. I love, I've even the word matrix before, long before Andrew Tate took that word over because of Jean Baudrillard. But when people talk like this, they are trying to make it feel like they are smart, like they have something to say. Another example, when people are being overly complimentary, like they're just being way too nice. And when it's done to you for the first time, you're like, okay, that's kind of cool. But then when you realize they do it to everybody, it's like, oh shit, this is kind of creepy. But they're doing it for them. They're not doing it for you anymore. They're not giving out genuine, real compliments. And that's the same thing with politically correct language. They are trying to show that they are up to date, that they know. And they're trying to demonize and polarize you when most of the time, the earlier term isn't inherently negative. Calling someone homeless is the, tr is the truth. And obviously there are more like offensive words like faggot that don't necessarily or shouldn't really be a mainstream commonplace term because they're, it's kind of very aggressive and negative and it has really no point when just, you can just call them gay or queer or like whatever other word is the word for gay now. And because we live in this narcissistic society and we, the sibling society, a self-centered world, this has continued to drive most of people's political preferences. They think they need to care about the environment or do this or do that as a way to virtue signal us that they're not bad people. But what makes someone good? And we're going to get into that now because David Foster Wallace hits the nail on the head. Because once you hit the next level, once you go to the next level, and it's all connected to language, none of these people want to engage in the actual work. They want to use base level, politically correct language to actually obfuscate the rest of us so that they can escape and not actually create real change in their own heart and in the, in the, in the actual world. So continuing with Wallace up here, the unpleasant truth is that the same self-serving hypocrisy that informs politically correct English tends to infect and undermine the U.S. left's rhetoric in almost every debate over social policy. Take the ideological battle over wealth re redistribution via taxes, quotas, welfare, enterprise zones, AFDC, TANF, you name it. As long as redistribu redistribution is conceived as a form of charity or compassion and the bleeding left appears to buy this conception every bit as much as the heartless right, then the whole debate centers on utility. Does welfare help poor people get on their feet or does it foster passive dependence? Is government's bloated social services, bureaucracy, an effective way to dispense charity? And so on. And both camps have their arguments and preferred statistics and the whole thing goes around and round. Opinion. The mistake here lies in both sides' assumption that the real motives for re redistributing wealth and char are charitable or unselfish. The conservatives' mistake, if it is a mistake, is wholly conceptual. But for the leftists, assumption is a total, excuse me, is also a serious tactical error. Progressive liberals seem incapable of stating the obvious truth that we who are well off should be willing to share more of what we have with poor people, not just for poor people's sake, but for our own. We should share what we have in order to become less narrow and frightened and lonely and self-centered people. No one ever seems willing to acknowledge out loud the thoroughgoing self-interest that underlies all impulses toward economic equality, especially not U.S. progressives, who seem so invested in an image of themselves as uniquely generous and compassionate and not so like those selfish conservatives over there, that they allowed the conservatives to frame the debate in terms of charity and utility, terms under which redistribution seems far less obviously a good thing. I'm talking about this example in such a general and simplistic way because it helps show why the type of leftist vanity that informs politically correct English is actually inimical to the left's own causes. For in refusing to abandon the idea of themselves as uniquely generous and compassionate, morally superior, progressives lose the chance to frame the redistribu redistributive arguments in terms that are both realistic and real political. One such argument would involve a complex, sophisticated analysis of what we really mean by self-interest, particularly the distinctions between short-term financial self-interest and the long-term moral or social self-interest. As it is, though, liberals' vanity tends to grant conservatives a monopoly on appeals to self-interest, enabling the conservatives to depict progressives as pie-in-the-sky idealists and themselves as real-world real back-pocket pragmatists. In short, leftist big mistake here is not conceptual or ideological, but spiritual and rhetorical. Their narcissistic attachment to assumptions that maximize their own appearance of virtue tends to cost them both the theater and the war. 
And I'm about to hit a passionate rant here, but if you guys like content like this, I just released a 3.5 hour breakdown of David Foster Wallace's views on language, politics, authority, and many other things. We break down Derrida's view on language, um, Heide, um, not Heidegger, well, Heidegger too, uh, Wittgenstein's view of language, and so much more. It's available in the Right Conscious Substack. I'll put the link down below. And very soon, there will be a lot more David Foster Wallace content over there. And if you join, you also get access to now 15 plus hours of Cormac McCarthy content that's always growing. And I'll soon also be releasing a course on building and writing sentences. So this is my soft launch pitch for that. Anyway, what Wallace is talking about here is the core of right conscious. This is more beautifully said than I may have ever been able to say it because the welfare debate, you guys hear it all the time. You hear, well, Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1960s, he created the welfare state and black single motherhood rose up and the black and black and minority education crumbled after that. Then you hear, say liberals say like, you know, what would we do with, you know, there are so many disabled people who without social welfare systems and disability and all this stuff and a bunch of old people who would be living out on the streets or have no way to survive. And the arguments go on the merry-go-round. But the core of everything is that once again, no one, if we're looking at the chakras, has transcended the base, base consciousness yet. We are totally self-identified because there are so many idiots out there who think, oh, life is all just about self-interest, Ian. We're all self-interested. Obviously, in certain times and moments, we have to you know, exist in that mode. But if you are existing in that mode, first of all, you're probably a logic bro. And I feel sorry for you because easily over 90% of my life is not focused on self-interest. It's on helping others, focusing on the inward aspects of myself that have nothing to do with myself. They have to do with obtaining mystical states and relaxing from all this primal energy, this base consciousness bullshit. But this is a human problem. I don't care if you are the most woke person or um, an anarchist libertarian living out in the woods. Most of the time, if you talk to people and go very deep down, all they care about is themselves. They are actually putting no value out in the world to help others. They are giving no, no charity, whether in money or with information or with time to help other people for the greater good. Because what's the whole point of learning standard written English? What's the whole point of learning to communicate and think effectively? Okay, so now I can read all these books and understand them and communicate. Well, as we talk about, step one is becoming a nonviolent human being, especially physically. Okay, I realize that I don't want to continue cycles of abuse. So I'm not going to be a piece of shit and hurt people. And then maybe if we get lucky, you also don't do that mentally or emotionally. But then step number two, like, okay, I've stopped the hurt cycle. What should I do now? Hmm. I should start being charitable. I should start helping because, wow, there's a lot of work to do. And it seems like society is against us and we're moving in a negative direction. So I should do something in a positive direction. That's the whole point of education is so that we can get there. But when you are polarized on both political sides, they don't want that. The conservatives want more money for the military and for this and that and, you know, do more tax cuts. And liberals obviously want more money for social programs or infrastructure and whatnot. But at the end of the day, one of the core problems of this country is that I have to pay, you know, this year, what did I pay? 25, 30 percent in taxes. And all that's going to a bunch of bullshit. I'm sitting here and paying for bombs to go fall on Palestine and for the Ukraine war and a bunch of stuff that I really don't want to support. I don't want my taxes to pay for random people's pensions who really didn't earn it and were doing corrupt things. And it's not just because I'm being selfish. I would happily pay over 50% of my yearly income, if not more. I could go to 60, 70% if I got to choose wholeheartedly where it was going. And it didn't go to the military industrial complex or uh, the ineffective education system or any of these other places. For instance, I really care about animals and shelters. I have rescued a ton of animals and I have very strong opinions about people who buy animals and are breeding animals when hundreds of thousands of animals die every single year in shelters alone and millions more are stuck in little cages and people could just as easily go get a puppy or a young cat or a relatively young animal that will serve their family just as good as buying it. But we continue to be a bunch of fucking idiots, a bunch of low-life dumbos who continue bringing the animals. Oh, I want, it's my right to breed this. I'm not going to spay or neuter. Why would I cut my balls off my dog? And I don't think any of those people have ever volunteered at a shelter or seen how bad they can really be in a big city. Go to like the Las Vegas Humane Society and see thousands of animals in cages this big, dogs that are kind and have great personalities just locked away and, go, and who are going to be killed. All because people make dumb decisions and can't take care of their pets or give them away. I know so many people who 
when life gets a little bit hard or they just don't want to take care of their pet anymore. They're like, you know, this is a little bit too much. So they just give their dog back. That's six years old. Those are the biggest low life pieces of scum ever. Or people like, yeah, I wanted to move somewhere else in the apartment complex. Didn't, didn't take animals. So it is what it is. No, you guys suck. Anyway, you guys can see how passionate I am about this. So I would be more than willing to give a lot of my money toward that cause. I also give away free YouTube content every single day, free information. I have been for seven years. I have in totality on YouTube across all my different channels, seven or 800 videos. Probably have another two to three books worth of blog posts out online too. But you never hear politicians or people talking about the actual solution, which is to awaken people through education, through standard written English. And in through fiction, you know, various forms of dialects to help people think and feel so that they can become nonviolent and become charitable. But there are shields and politically correct English is a shield to act like you were doing the work, but not doing the work. It's like the dude that's a little bit overweight, but he talks about working out all the time. And like you could tell you're like, dude, you're not strong. You're kind of fat and you're giving me workout advice. Why are you talking about it? And you've been doing this for years. You seem to have been doing something wholeheartedly wrong the wrong time excuse me, the whole time. Have you even been working out? Do you actually diet? Do you care about this? And they are over splendid and talking about working out. So you don't have to turn the light back on them and be like, Hey, you're probably unhealthy. And they don't want to turn that light back on themselves because it's hard work to get in shape. It's hard to be an intelligent feeling human being is very hard work. And the matrix is growing every day in terms of politically correct language. And it's becoming more divisive because the other core problem of all this is that we have an issue with politically correct language on the left. But on the right now, we have an ever increasing media campaign to create religiously correct English and a religious, religiously correct reality. Because I am on the ground, you guys. I have worked in multiple states and no teachers all across the country. What you guys hear about these books, like, oh my God, there's pornographic books in school and the kids are hearing all this stuff, that you have been fed a lie. There are schools that do that in like liberal states or in these crazy school districts or that have these radical librarians or in places like Canada. Sure, that stuff's happening, but in the United States proper, most of the time that is not happening. And the people who are censoring their children from learning and growing emotionally and whatnot, obviously most of the time aren't the left because the left... And when you see leftists, we're t I'm talking in generalizations here, they get usually sucked into the vacuum because of youth. They find figures and media and get a part of these movements from people outside of their parents. Maybe their parents help get them into the funnel, but active leftism and like the trends of that movement are very active and they tend to more of the younger side. But on the right, if you are raising a family in a, a very religiously or trying to keep them away from things, then you have to block them from certain information. And most people in the world are not educated and don't understand the power, for instance, of postmodernism or of a differentiated education that encompasses many different things. A strong-willed human, a strong-willed teenager who is intelligent and is growing should be exposed to things that are hard, that challenge their religion. Because if they can't handle that, then they're not truly religious. They are just in a cult. They are just being programmed to believe something and forced into it and not being shown all the other options and told why that those why those other options are wrong because most of the time their parents aren't smart enough to explain why those other options are wrong. And they're and even worse. Almost no one is able to explain how we can integrate. How can we integrate Jean Baudrillard into Christianity or into our belief system or like some of the negative aspects of reality that these people are so scared of? You can use a lot. You can reverse a lot of energy and make it a positive if you know what you are doing. But now we have a lot of people on the right censoring everything, what they're, everything that their children are learning. They are being dogmatic with the language and with the ideas that their children are intaking. And we, so we have one side who is way too open-minded and we're creating a new side that is way too close-minded. And it's going to be a disaster, you guys. I see both of these dialects all the time as a teacher. I see a child and I'm like, you are 14. How are you this open? How do you know all this? How do you believe this? This is way too radical. And I'm a very radical human being. And I'm saying, I'm like, damn, this is crazy. Then I see other kids. I'm like, you're 14. How are you this serious? How are you this logical? Why are you taking this approach? And then as you start to get to know them, you're like, oh, this is your parents. This is because they are forcing you to do this. And when you look at a lot of personal development stuff or motivational stuff or even religion, what's one of the main aspects of it? Well, it's supposed to help remove you, remove you from self-interest. There are always these community aspects involved. But from what I've seen, if you just rely on any religion, even, even stuff like Buddhism or yoga or certain practices like gratefulness, meditation, prayer, like I'm talking about the whole scope of religious activities, you usually fall short 
of overcoming self-interest because we live in an ever more complex world with um, capitalism in these things. And we don't necessarily have the freedom to just go live on, our, live, on, live on our own or homestead or move away from this society. And so we are thrust into a world that is 100% focused on self-interest. And a lot of our media and the structures within our reality also push that self-interest. So a lot of these old things don't work for us anymore, at least in full. They get us somewhat there if you take them seriously. And that's where English, excuse me, knowledge comes in. Because if you can think well and write well, then you can start to research. You can start to really go deep and start to combine things. Because I think that things have gotten so complicated now that you need a multifaceted approach to be able to push back against this because most of us have experienced trauma. And so how are you going to deal with that trauma? But then how are you also going to educate yourself and deal with your family and deal with your own emotions and your own genetic strengths and weaknesses? And when I look at what I figured out and the most effective things, it's a huge mis uh, mishmash of stuff from every single religion. There's stuff from Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism and uh, Peruvian shamanism. A ton of stuff just that's from philosophy and books. And there's stuff from the business world, the personal development world, things I've just learned from my own experience. And I've had to integrate them all together. And this is just the trivium once again. We have grammar. We have me getting all the information. Then there's a logical side to it. How do I put it together? And that's a art too. Then how do I speak it and live it out into reality with rhetoric? And one last note on politically correct English, if we all hit this level, if we just hit level one of becoming nonviolent human beings, then we wouldn't need any of this. Once again, if I'm calling someone homeless, that shouldn't be the most offensive thing in the world. If I'm like, damn, you smelly, you homeless guy. You suck, man. Go get a job. You, What's wrong with you? That's me being negative. But I'm like, hey, that's a homeless dude over there. That's nothing. All these things that we are being policed on, unless we are doing it in a violent way, you know, emotionally or mentally or even physically to someone else, then it shouldn't necessarily matter. And once we transcend that, it won't matter. And so these are all just these little corrections and these bullshit ways to help us stop being violent. People think that if we somehow change the pronouns we call people or like if people are resistant, you know, that language creates violence, which it does at a small level. But like the arguments today about if you don't follow our political, you know, they couldn't get away with this, this stuff in Wallace's time. They're like, hey, can you just call, say what we want to be called? Or like, can you be politically correct? And we're like, and people are like, no, we're not going to do that. So now they've gone to the utmost extreme. They say, if you don't do this, you, you're promoting violence against us. There are people dying on the streets today because of people like you saying this stuff. It promotes the cycle of violence and white supremacy and all this other crazy stuff. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, okay, I, like I said, on a minuscule level, that actually does happen. But is this the hill you're going to die on? Is this the hill you're going to be annoying on? This is terrible. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to solve the biggest problem that humanity's ever had to face, which is our, the violence within our own soul. So my protocol for you guys out there is don't listen to me. Listen to what's calling toward you in the fields of knowledge. Do things. You know, what is calling to you in terms of personal development? Could be prayer, could be meditation, could be taking walks out in nature, or just learning how to generally have conversations and connect with people. But whatever it feels like you are being called toward in, in, in the realm of knowledge and in in-person activities, go and do those and do those deeply. Master those, read books on those things and go as deep as you can and then move on to the next thing. And if you keep moving on like that for five or 10 years, you will have solved 99% of your problems and you'll be like solving micro problems. There doesn't have to be, hey, you need to read Dune, then the Sandman, and then um, read all Baudelaire's bibliography. Our intuition, our soul is strong. It knows what we need. So just follow that. All this noise, all this this political polarization and bullshit on social media, it's all preventing us from just doing that. And I know you, when you look back at your own life and the biggest quantum leaps, another Vogue word, that you've made, 99% of the time, it's when you let your intuition guide you, when you don't force things, when you kind of move toward what you know you're supposed to be moving toward and, don't, and not resist it. And maybe it's not logical, maybe you don't know what it means but it will lead you somewhere. I was called to go back to university even, and I learned basically nothing during my second uh, stint at university. I got these degrees and oh my God, but what it did, and I, what, and it ruined my body, like my health went downhill, mental and physical, but what I did get was I met my wife and I met some great friends. I met people that changed my life and continue to change my life. That's what I was being called toward. 
I was isolated, living out in the middle of nowhere, out in the desert every single day in isolation. And I got called back to the social, but I felt like I had, I was being called to the intellectual, but it was really a way for me to socially upgrade my life forever. And so you don't know where these paths and these pulls are leading you toward. But I can guarantee you, if you let it happen, it will pull you into a more nonviolent and less self-interested state.